parts in terms of how a linguist would analyze them. Irregular memorized forms and regular rule generated forms. If there's a distinction between phonology, namely the accent or sound pattern of a language, and morphology, namely conjugation and uh, declension, uh, and syntax, the arrangement of words, could we expect to find these distinctions in different systems in the human brain? Well, not in the sense of the old phrenology diagram where each patch of brain uh, implements a different mental power. We know that the brain doesn't work that way. It is a intricately complex network of 100 billion neurons interconnected by 100 trillion synapses or, or connections. And there's no reason that it should look like the, the, the flank state and the rump roast of the supermarket cow with the dotted lines separating the parts. And mapping the mind to the brain is one of the great frontiers of, uh, of science, of human knowledge. We've tried to make a stab at it uh, by looking at some of the major distinctions in language to see if we can uh, map out some of the brain circuits that, that uh, implement them. Now, when you study the human brain, unlike, say, the brain of a mouse, you've got the obvious uh, disadvantage that most people don't want to donate their brains to science when they're alive. And uh, people don't take well to holes being drilled into their skull or parts being taken out. So you've got to be ingenious in trying to figure out what the human brain does. And if you're interested in language, it's the human brain that you're pretty much stuck with. So with some collaborators, a former graduate student named Michael Ullman and my late colleague Suzanne Corkin, we tried to see if we could look at just the basic distinction between the procedural system of language, the algorithms, the rules, the parts that generate regular forms like walk walked and uh, sext, sexted, dox doxed, on the one hand, the irregular memory dependent form uh, part of language, bring, brought, cling, clung, uh, sleep, slept, and so on. If we were right that this division within language is really a division in our uh, psychology, and ultimately a division uh, in our brains, then we should be able to see it using some of the indirect techniques that neuropsychologists use. Uh, namely, you work with people who have had various kinds of injuries to the brain or degeneration, use that as a kind of experiment of nature where nature has already done a manipulation and you try to use that to see what it reveals about how the mind uh, dissociates into parts. For stroke patients who suffer a kind of aphasia, a loss of language uh, called Broca's aphasia, named after Broca's area, itself named after the neurologist Paul Broca, an area low in the left hemisphere in the frontal lobe of the brain, most obviously connected to uh, articulation and pronunciation and planning, but even though Broca's area may be a little patch uh, when we look at it with our eyes, there are hundreds of millions of neurons and there's an awful lot going on in that area and it's deeply connected to other areas of the brain. It's not like it work, it's works by itself. But, and so Broca's aphasia can occur with a variety of kinds of damage. But what they all kind of have in common is that there's more of an impairment in the rule-based part of language than in the memory-based. It's all a, a relative matter, and it predicts that patients with egrammatism, that is difficulty in sequencing words, should also have more difficulty with regular verbs like uh, walk walked, or in the case of a uh, novel verb like to, what is the past tense of blick, we all say blicked, but if your rule component is compromised, that's going to be a real challenge because you've never heard it before. In contrast, we could look at a form of uh, aphasia following injury to a different part of the brain, more the posterior left hemisphere, that results in a condition called anomia, that is lack of uh, names in particular nouns, where these patients will often be quite fluent, unlike Broca's patients who are halting and uh, a stumbling in putting words together. Patients with anomia are perfectly fluent, but they have horrible word finding difficulty. It's always the thing and the, the, the guy, uh, and they, they grasp for words even though they have no trouble using them in sentences. 
There, the prediction is they should have more trouble with the irregular forms of language. They should might even make errors, as kids do, and say sleep, sleeped, uh, bring, bringed. Indeed, uh, we, we found that. Uh, we even found a similar dissociation between the computational part of the brain and the memory part of the brain in two different degenerative conditions. Alzheimer's disease, which everyone knows involves tragic losses of memory, including difficulties in finding words. But because of the particular pattern of degeneration in Alzheimer's disease, it often hits the memory system more than the computational or procedural system. And Alzheimer's patients, until the later stages, can often be quite fluent, even though they have trouble finding the right word. In contrast, Parkinson's disease conspicuously involves difficulty in initiating motion and in control over the muscles. But the part of the brain that controls our actions blends into the part that controls our plans, our thoughts, our procedures. And indeed, Parkinson's uh, disease patients sometimes have trouble in ordering uh, words properly. We thought, well, if we're, we're right, that the irregular part of language is more memory-based, the regular part is more procedural-based, uh, we should see different patterns of errors in patients with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and indeed, uh, that is what you find. The difference is not stark enough that you could use this as a diagnosis, and of course there are other ways of diagnosing, but it is a, a way of uh, working with these patients, suffering these tragedies, in order to deepen our understanding of the relationship between the mind and the